two words that I want you to, you know, if you're writing down things, there's two words that are at the center at what I talk about. And as I continue on in my career, these two words keep popping up over and over again. And I wrote them down up here, sort of. Empathy. Empathy. E-M-P-A-T-H-Y. And it's just like, what? Empathy? What is it? And, and, and to make it a longer statement, an empathy for your students' prior knowledge. And empathy for what your students know and what they don't know. And, and here's another one that may you know, make you think a little bit. An empathy for their culture from which they come. Because some students, if their parents are both medical doctors, know how to run your class or know how to survive and thrive in your class very easily. You know, they're used to that type of conversation at the kitchen table. But if students are coming from a background where neither parent has been to higher education, they're trying to figure out the rules of the game, which can be just as difficult as figuring out the physiology of the heart. And empathy for that kid is important. You know, if you want that kid to survive, you have to realize that their struggles are a little bit different than the kid who comes from an academic background where, yeah, I know, I know the rules of the game. Um, but then the empathy for prior knowledge is, is, is key when we get to the second word. And the second word is inquiry. And I don't know how you spell it in Australia, but in the United States we spell it with an I. Is it an E here? Is it an E or an I? I? Oh, you're right then. You spell it with an E or wrong. No. <laughs> uh, but inquiry. Um, and, and that's a word that's terribly misused in education and in science. But, you know, what does the word inquiry mean is, is a difficult question. What does it mean to inquire? Um, Anybody have an answer? Anybody have an idea? I've been working on it for years, and I think I finally got something that's useful. To inquire means you're trying to figure something out. It means you're trying, and this is the, this is the part where I'm going to take credit, this is my bet here. You're trying to resolve a doubt, like a magic trick. You watch a magician do a trick, and you try, how'd they do that? How'd they do that? And when you're teaching your students, you want to put them into a position when they're inquiring about something. They're trying to figure something out. Now, if I just say, this is my mandible, this is my maxilla, this is my zygomatic, what bone is this? Mandible. Is that inquiry? No. You've got to move beyond that. You know, in my world, you know, online education, you know, my administrators are saying, put this online. Can't you do this online? Put, do more online stuff. And in physiology and anatomy, there's lots and lots of material that we can put online. Because it's easy. Learning your bones, sorry, anatomists, this is pretty easy. Okay, is that fair? No. But, you know, but then to, to do advanced puzzles with anatomy is tough. But, you know, just to start, Learning your bones, you know, you can do that at home. You can do that at home and, and do that online. But when you come to class, when you come to my classroom, this is what I want to do. <coughs> Inquiry. Inquiry. And now here's, here's an important bit that gets back to, you know, the empathy thing. For my entry-level students, for me to put them into a position where they're inquiring, is uh, sometimes difficult because I don't know what's confusing to them, what's easy to them, and, and what's, what's a terrible, difficult puzzle for my students is very simple for a senior level physiology student. It's just like, oh, this is easy. You know, if you take a third year math person and give them a first year math problem, they just, it's not inquired. It's not inquired. It's, it's following a solution. You know, they know the steps. But for students to truly inquire, you've got to know what they don't know, and then give them a puzzle. Give them a puzzle. And so my research is looking at how to find these puzzles that students can solve in entry-level physiology that will help them develop a robust background so they can go on into whatever career and, and be able to have kind of the foundation of, of physiology. And here's my line. I want them to think like a physiologist. It used to be that I would say, I want them to know what a physiologist knows. I want them to know what an anatomist knows. And that's not realistic, because they're beginning level students. And their the vocabulary just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go along. But to get these thinking skills to think like a physiologist, that's a good step. 
And so more and more, I'm cutting down my anatomy lists in my first year course. I have more and fewer bones, fewer muscles, but I'm upping the inquiry. That's what I'm pushing. So just some background. What I'm known for is flipped classrooms, you know, getting students to uh, do a lot of stuff at home, do this homework where you're doing the things that I call filling the bucket, you know, developing the vocabulary, learning the terminology. And then when you come to the classroom, that's where we want you to engage in group learning, where you are together trying to solve a puzzle. And the word pogo, is that up there? Oh, that's another one. I'm looking to slide ahead. Um, my professional organization in the United States is called HAPS. HAPS, Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. And then I'm along with working with college level uh, educators. I'm also working in high schools. And I think you use secondary schools, high schools. But we are teaching more and more um, anatomy and physiology at the secondary level. And I have some teachers that are really good at inquiry. And they're very, very skilled. And I'm lucky to work with them. My college level professors, they're not as good at inquiry yet. They're starting to learn. But, uh, but, oh, this is important. Educators might know this line. I'll see if I'm wrong. What's the number one rule of teaching? What's the number one rule of teaching? Let's see if this makes sense. You teach the way you've been taught. You teach the way you've been taught. That means if you grew up and went to school listening to lectures, guess what you do? You now, as a teacher, as now as an educator, give lectures. And so to change that is difficult. So to change from a person who lectures into a person who teaches these inquiry things, these puzzles, is a difficult process. But that's what I'm up to. That's, I'm trying to help professors change their teaching practices from standard lecture to inquiry. And my source of inspiration are my high school teachers, because they've been teaching with inquiry all along. They're much better at it than my college professors, at least in the States. Um, but here is my grant that's kind of brought me here. And this is POGO, Process-Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. And that's POGO. And POGO is big in chemistry. And if anybody in here is a chemist, and I, I bet in uh, Melbourne somewhere around here, you have chemists that are using the POGO method. Uh, but POGO, I'm going to introduce in, this, in the next slide, uh, is, is, is my method that I use to try to help physiology educators promote this inquiry learning. And then the other two organizations I mentioned, HAPS, that's, who I, that's my professional organization. And the National Science Foundation is our government organization that provided the grant money for this uh, research endeavor. See what we got. Oh, there's my number one rule of teaching. Do you know it? Do you know it? Then I should show this. Um, how many of you teach in a voice that looks a little bit like this? Look familiar? I lived here for 15 years. You know, I, I know how to teach here, and I'm very comfortable here. I can, I can talk in here for days and days and days. I now teach in a room that looks like this. And this room is actually a very good room. You know, we have the little circular tape. But I'm going to spend the rest of my career working in, and we call these active learning rooms. Sometimes they're called scale-up rooms. They've got a lot of different names. But there's a lot of differences here. Um, the big one is all the seats here are pointed to the screen. There's one, if you stand right here, everybody's looking at you. You are the center of attention. And there's theater here. You know, there's theater. You know, I'm a sage on the stage. I am performing. Now here, where's the center? Where's the center? You know, the teacher's station, I think, is right there. But here you have typically nine students looking at each other. And how do you teach in a room where students are looking at each other? You know, how do you, what do you do in that room? That's what I'm trying to figure out. And, and that's a great puzzle. I love this room. It feels right. As a professional educator, as somebody who's been teaching a long time, I get tired of students sleeping, you know, reading the newspaper, texting, you know, they're doing, you know, it's just like, are you thinking? You know, and, and I, can, I can put on a great show here. I can put on a great show, but I can, I can make students think better here. But I'm going to be real honest. When I first started in this room, I had some really bad days. This is tough. 
And it was just like, oh, put me back in the lecture hall. I know what I'm doing there. But here, it takes some time. It takes time to figure out what's going on because it's all sorts of new things, all sorts. And I like that. But I have people that, that get these rooms built on their campuses and, and the administrators saying, you're moving here, you're moving here. And when I tell people if you're in that situation, I say, try to negotiate for the first semester to spend one day here, one day there, one day here, one, just to give yourself a break. I jumped in, boom, it was too much, it's too much. But, you know, I had a few tools that enabled me to survive. But this was, that was a good, good experience. I'm happy to be there, but it's been a while. My teaching evaluations, boom, they fell for a couple of years. And my boss knew what was going on. She was happy I took on the risk. And I'm very blessed to have a good boss. It's just like, that's fine, keep trying. I said, I want to keep going. I don't want to give up. There were days that I wanted to give up. All right, talked enough. Um, we're going to do an activity. This is a polo activity that's almost been endorsed. It's not quite endorsed yet. Um, but I'm going to do what I do as an uh, instructor in a, in a classroom now. I need you to look and find groups of two or three. I'm not going to put you in groups, but you need groups of two or three. This is going to be a little easy. I'm not going to hit the goal of inquiry as much as I would like with this, but I want you to empathize with being an 18-year-old now. Okay? I want you to pretend you're an 18-year-old. And, and this is an important part of Pogo. You have roles because what happens to a lot of students when you put them in groups, they don't know what they do. They don't know their part. What's my part? And so a very simple thing to do, and this is a part of Pogo, is you give students a role. You have a role of a reader, the person who verbalizes what they see on here. You have a recorder, the person who writes things down. And this is my favorite, a doubter. Yeah. This is the one who says, are we sure of that? I love that. The, the doubter says, are we sure of that? And then the presenter is the person who at the end has to stand up and defend their answers. And I love that too. And in my room, we have all sorts of whiteboards around the room. And we have the, the presenter write something on the board and then stand next to it. And then I can call on him, call on him, call on him. Really? You said that? Are you sure about that? That's, you know, I'm just putting, putting that, you know, put them on the spot. I like that. So you have four roles right here. Why don't you, in the next 10 seconds, figure out which roles you're going to have. And I recommend splitting these two up and splitting these two up. Go. And if you got three people, figure it out. All right, we're going to get started. And I am purposely not going to give you uh, one copy per person. You know, that's a real, that's another trick of cooperative learning. If you give... Uh, you know, one copy per person. You know, you, you might have one person take off and say, "I'm going to lead my group," but uh, you know, it's, you know, limit the resources, and now you got to share, and it's going to put you in a spot where you're closer to each other, and we like that in cooperative learning. We have the phrase "knee to knee" and "eye to eye," and if you're knee to knee and eye to eye, good things typically happen. You know, you've got to share ideas, and oh, here's a. You know, you ever heard of Vygotsky? Vygotsky. Yeah. Who, what do you know about Vygotsky? Um, he's a psycholinguist. Uh, yeah. A psycholinguist and uh, talks about how learning is uh, essentially socio-constructive. Perfect. Socio-constructivist. But you know, even a physiologist, you know, it takes a little bit of education stuff. And there's some education stuff that doesn't make sense to me. It's just like, no, it's just baloney. But Vygotsky, I think, was good. Vygotsky was good. But he said. Learning is a social endeavor. For your knowledge to have utility, it must be put into a social context. And having a conversation, intelligent conversation, is how you learn. That's how you learn, you know, from, from birth to whatever age you are. But engaging in good conversation enables you to, and here's the education, cognitive psychology stuff, construct an understanding. It enables you to construct an understanding, which is something that's very difficult to do in a typical lecture. And so I'm going to give you an activity that's hopefully going to help you construct an understanding of what's inside the body and what's outside the body. 
And this activity, again, is going to be kind of simple for you if you are a physiologist. But empathize with an entry-level student. <laughs> but you now have your roles, you have your activities. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to work through this activity. Your worksheets and uh, go away. This is when the good stuff starts. Um, we are trying, oh, I, I tell this to my... Uh, to my high school teachers and to my college professors both, you get right down to it, and what we're trying to do now is get you to doubt your answers. And Vygotsky would love it. Because out of, that, out of that kind of doubtiness comes understanding. Or at least the motivation of, you know, I gotta do some more reading on this. I gotta figure this out. And I want you know, figure this out, it's big. So I'm gonna, I'll have presenters stand up. Who's the presenters? <laughs> Ah, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna start over here. Um, but I'm gonna pick on you because I kind of know you. Number four, um, is, um, blood in the body. Is you consider uh, is blood inside or outside the body? Inside. And what must happen for it to come outside? Yeah, uh, injure a membrane. If it injure a membrane, and then it can escape. Yep. Okay, I think you, know, you can be seated now. I call it. Here. This is good. What organ system? We'll see if you got that one for number five. Uh, the of the skin. Very good. And was there any discussion on that one? I think we had some discussion because it's like in the gut, you know, it's the, the integumentary system. Very good. You can sit down. Okay. <laughs> Six caused some problems, right? Six has caused some problems. And see what I did to Julia over here, and this is what I make people do. And I want, you know, just take a step back a second. Now, most of you have graduate students that you require them to present posters, right? You require them to present their information in a public setting. That's what we are modeling here. You know, make a statement. It's a simple sentence or a simple phrase, and you've got to stand next to it. And you say, I created this, I'm defending this. So, uh, what did you write down, Julia? Well, we created this, and we are going to defend it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Can I just say that we forgot we were 18 year olds when we wrote this? Um, but we decided 18 year olds actually knew what a peculiar source was. Depending on where you're at in the semester. <laughs> The inside the body meant that, that it would be contained, contained within a barrier. But that barrier could be the skin, or it could be epithelial cells lying in the respiratory system, in the gut, for example. Okay. Now, anybody have this? Is everyone happy? Everybody happy with that one? Uh, if they lie in the gut, they would be epithelial cells. Oh, that's specific. Oh, sorry, I take that back. I was going to say, I thought you could. No, I'm I get that I was wondering story. about that. That's pretty fine. All right, we're happy. We're happy. Someone oh. Do you have an objection? Well, so uh, so the uh, the air in the lungs is inside the body. No. Ooh. Well, I, I second that notion as well. We we actually had to create a second uh, set of criteria that says so. You want to amend it? So even though you're within the physical body, but as long as you're outside the tracks that are contained in the body, you're still considered outside the body. So that's, that's what we decided. So, for example, um, if you're in the digestive tract, yes, it follows that, you're okay with that. And, but although it's within the body, but you're still outside the real body itself because of a clear barrier, like you said. So air is also, so just to modify, just even within tracks that are within the body, you can still remain outside. So there's still a physical barrier. So we'll call this a friendly amendment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, right. so, 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 so air and air will be all the cells outside the body. That's right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. All right. Whereas no. you had a... No. No. Yes. No. 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 So, would you have, you know, now obviously I would go over to this group and look at your answer and see if there's a critique. We only have one whiteboard, but you would have something a little more. Oh, that's fine. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Ah. We had a slightly different version from that again. So, um, neither of us are like general nurses, so excuse us, but you know. Um, we actually said that um, the internal organs cannot be viewed externally uh, without an invasive examination. So that can kind of put a bit more into it. 
So how does that define whether it's inside or outside? Inside, if it's outside, you can visually inspect can it, it. Okay. without an invasive examination. Mm. Whereas in so it's a colonoscopy and well, invasive? Yeah, that's invasive. Yeah. That's, that's what about ultrasound? I thought she was invasive. Yeah, but that's using, you know, we're talking about external being viewed by the naked eye. What if I get a couple of lenses and put somebody's yeah. front lens? Yeah, that would mm -hmm. be internal because you're actually using instruments to look inside. Also by naked eye. But, but what yeah. about if somebody opens their mouth? That would be an, that examination as well. So you're looking internal. And you see so we're just looking externally like mm -hmm. a skin injuries. Or if you feel yeah. something under someone's skin, like if you don't have to, you can kind of identify that there's a lump or something. Yeah, but then you'd be doing follow-up with physical um, investigations that would be invasive. <laughs> 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 That's the first thing in charge. I have to cut this off and move on. Because we're having a good discussion. But we have, I have to admit, we're a little bit beyond what my normal 18-year-old is. <laughs> We've lost that word empathy. <laughs> we're using language now that they would not be using. But is this messy? Coming up with a good description of what's in is it messy? Yes. Is science yes. messy? Yes. Is what we do for a living messy? Yes. And that's all oh, this is my good days is when we have arguments in the classroom using the language of that chapter. When my students get into arguments, I smile. And not over, you know, who won the football game or anything, but you know, you, is it inside or outside? Come on. But no, that's good stuff. Um, so we're going to move on, but six is a, is a key question, and it's troubling. It's, not, it's a tough one, even for people who are PhD physiologists. Um, number seven, this is easy. Why don't we, uh, let's, let's just yell these out. Food in the digestive, yell these out, everybody. Food in the digestive tract. Outside. Air and lungs. Outside. 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 Blood in the cardiovascular system. Inside. Inside. We agreed on that one. <laughs> You're in the bladder. Outside. Outside. Here's my going on the real. Brain in the skull. Inside. Inside. Oh, this is the one. <laughs> Just let's hear it by yourself on this one. The fetus in the uterus. Clearly inside. Clearly inside. Does anybody want to take them on? You're going to argue that the fetus is outside. And so let's hear it. But the gut, oh no, it's going to be covered through it, and it doesn't ever go into the body. We got a lot of midwifery feeling. <laughs> 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 it does have to breach the barrier. It does, yeah, it does. The cervix. But, but oh, the no, that's his own. No, no, but the, from development. Isn't there any difference to a gastrointestinal sphincter when food comes through that? Yeah. No, I reckon that's a good barrier. <laughs> <laughs> It depends on whether you're a primary program or not. Now, if he was your student, well, would you say he's a good student or just being able to change the butt? Is he a good student? Look at this. Is he doing a good job? Yeah. That's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. You got students who are professional doubters. All right, just for the sake of time, we're going to be moving on here. Um, number eight. Let's see here. 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 Let's see and the other four of you, Mom, you're off the book. I'm going to let you sit down. But number 10, I'm going to have my doubt. Okay, so this is a tattoo of my TA. My TA, uh, we came up with this one, has a mitochondria on his arm. And this is a very good question. So uh, is, a, is a tattoo inside or outside the body? What do we say? Inside, we decide. Because? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, with a, a deep layer of the skin. And that's enough. That's enough for me. It moves around with me. It, uh, moves it's around pretty difficult to detach. <laughs> and, uh, All right. Anybody object? You have no objections. Have no objections. All right. Have a seat. Oh, have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now, my students will often ask, you know, Professor Jensen, is a tattoo, et cetera, outside your body? And, uh, you know, that's the end of the class, right? And do you think I give them the answer? No. Do I have an answer? No. no. <laughs> that means it's a good question. That means it's a good question. Have you heard these terms, convergent and divergent? Yes. Convergent questions and divergent questions, these are gold. And now, this is, 
Oh man, the toughest part of my job now is not working with students, it's coming up with good questions to give the students. Coming up with good questions that put them in the position to inquire, that's tough. And it's actually engineering. It's engineering a question that gets them to think. You know, and this tattoo question is a good example of a divergent question. A divergent question is one that has multiple answers. Multiple answers, all good, all having strengths and weaknesses. What's a convergent question? Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees after discussion. After you discuss, everybody agrees that this is the best one. And those are good questions too. What bone is this? Is that a good convergent question? No, it's too boring, too easy. You know, mandible, mm, boring. But tattoo, you know, inside, outside, yeah. You know, and how about the fetus one? That's a pretty good example of a convergent one. Because initially, you know, people who don't know the language, don't know physiology, are 18 years old, they're going, no way. You can't be, fetus is inside the body. It's got to be. It's got to be. But for most, most physiologists, mm -hmm. you physiologists, What's your area? GP. GP? Oh, that's functional. That's totally functional. That's a functional. 18 year old GP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but would your GP, you know, would you guys deal with this concept at all? No. Physiologists, we do though. This is essential concept. Um, was there a good discussion? That actually the goal. You know, that's the goal. It's just good discussion. Um, so. Just some background on what we just did. This is Pogel, and that those letters, P-O-G-I-L is an acronym, Process Oriented Guided Inquiry. Guided Inquiry is a key term, learning. And Guided Inquiry versus Open Inquiry. There's something called Open Inquiry, and that's kind of what you do in your research lab. Open inquiry is what you do in a research lab where nobody is guiding you. You're going by your own wits. You read an article, you read another article, you talk to somebody, you go down a path and it's just not working, you come back and you talk to somebody else. But open inquiry is terribly difficult for 18, 19 year olds. There is a difference between inquiry and confusion. And most students, you gotta, you got to kind of navigate the ship for them a little bit to give them some clues, to give them some hints. That's guided inquiry. <laughs> but just say, here it is, figure it out. I don't know what to do. And they give up. At least in the States, my students give up. It's too confusing. And that's, again, dialing it in, trying to figure things out. And here's, this is an important lesson. What is a good activity for my students might be too easy for your students. And what's terribly confusing for my students might be perfect for yours. And so you've got to, you know, this is the art of teaching. You've got to dial it in for your students. It's not one size fits all. It's, it's you know, you've got, you've got to customize these things. Um, <coughs> here's the theory. <coughs> fighting my virus. Theoretical underpinnings, cooperative group learning, inquiry-based learning, and constructivism. This is the Gatsby thing. This has got a lot of people behind it. Inquiry, this is like Piaget and some other education researchers. And cooperative group learning, there's, a, there's these two kind of go together. But I have some colleagues that are big into cooperative group learning and I've taken some of their workshops. And so I've, I've learned some tricks. And that's probably the toughest thing to ask academic professionals to do is to learn how to become cooperative group teachers. Because in a room where you are knee to knee and eye to eye and get students working, together, it's, it's a lot of work, uh, especially if you've got, you know, mobile phones, you know, and, and people who are looking out the window, and just off-task behavior. How do you get people back on task? And that's, you learn tricks, you learn tricks. But to work in groups, a big first step is to assign those roles. Give, you know, what's your role? Why are you looking at your phone? Is it looking at your phone a role? No. You're the doubter. Okay, let's hear some doubter. But you put them on the spot. Um, so these uh, process skills and content objectives, okay, there's two things going on here. There's two things going on. I sometimes say there's two trains running. You know these things, content objectives. Every discipline has content which they want to teach, such as the concept of inside and outside the body, such as oxygen dissociation curves, such as you name it. 
You know, and you've got your list, and you've come together in meetings and kind of said, these are the things that we want our students to learn. And almost everybody's got those. This is probably new. These process objectives, these are skills that your administrators often talk about. But you probably don't talk about them so much in your department meetings. But when they talk about teamwork and communication skills and management, these are all kind of in this Pogoli thing too. In a Pogo activity, we want students to learn what it's like to work as a team. You know, are you a good team member? Can you communicate clearly with somebody who's different than you? With that in mind, do you suppose I let students um, choose their own teams? No. No. And you know, in, in my class, what will happen there, my Somali students will sit together, my suburban kids will sit together, my jocks will sit together, and they segregate themselves. Sometimes I can make up a shift, though. I make them shift. Mm -hmm. Do it on the first day. If you don't do it on the first day, they won't, you know, it's even harder. But on the first, at least in the States, on the first day they listen to you. <laughs> you got one day. <laughs> one day. And so I, 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 make, I make them switch. I make them switch. That's part of, I just say, this is my job. It's my job to make you work. And you came to the University of Minnesota to work with diverse types of people and learn what the rest of the world's like. Starts today. We're putting you in with people that probably were born in a different country than you were. And you're going to start this lesson now. What is it like to work with somebody different than yourself? And I've got lots of stories there. Some failures, too. You know, I've got success stories, but I've also got failures. There were people just, no, they're not getting along. They're just not getting along. But all these things typically are in, you know, the higher administration's goals for, you know, once a student graduates from... University of Minnesota or whatever, they will be able to work in a, in a team and solve complicated problems, things like that. But this is a part of a Pogo class. You know, we are, we are addressing these things. And then we got the, tip, oh, and then we got the uh, content objectives. That's the next bit. We're going to have you work on your uh, uh, graphs that you brought. But to me, more and more, this is the power. This is the power of being able to achieve uh, the outcome objectives, and that's the learning cycle. Um, now, a learning cycle, there's not one of them. There's many, many, many different types of learning cycles. But I was a high school teacher before I went back to grad school, and the learning cycle that I learned was very useful, and it went this way. What, so what, now what? That was the learning cycle. It's just what, so what, now what? What are you trying to teach? So what? Now what? But that was that was the learning cycle that I learned, and I don't know who came up with that, but it was very useful. And I designed lessons around what, so what, and now what, and that might have taken an entire week to get through. Now this learning cycle is a bit different, and this is the one that's used in Pogo, but it's exploration, concept, invention, application. <coughs> the exploration bit is looking at what's called the model. Okay, and actually, let's look at this activity. Does anybody need an extra copy? We've got extra copies if you want to take them home. So we've got, we've got extras. We've got extras. Everybody got one? I'm going to put you to work here now. Oh, I got two more. Thank you. All right, starts here. We gotta start the cycle right here. Exploration. And exploration is the first step of the learning cycle, which involves simple questions that involve examining the model. So this is the model. This graphic up here is the model. And it's simple questions, sometimes called direct questions. And if students can't answer these, they're probably not gonna survive in the class. That's just honest. You know, you've got students that probably are not going to survive. And if they're struggling with the first couple questions on a poll activity, that's a sign. So mm -hmm. I want you to go through here and look at the first couple of questions and then figure out, are they uh, exploration questions? So look at the export, go look at uh, the first couple of questions and see, are they just exploration questions? Go ahead. So I'm going to try to give you a down right there. Okay, I think that's how you do it. Yeah. So, let's, so you're going to say either exploration, concept, invention, or application. 
And question number one. Are you ready? Yeah. E. Oh, e. Oh, e. 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 Did everyone say E? Yes. So I achieved one goal there. So, you know, I, I think I got everybody there. I'm trying, I'll pick on what I think are the obvious ones. Now let's go to number, uh, uh, let's see here, six. Look at number six. Everybody look at number six. And so you're going to say E. C I or A. C I or A. Ready? This is number six now. C I. I heard one A. Did you say an A over there? One A. One A figures. I think we'll just go with that. All right. Let's look at number ten. Look at number ten. The number. E, C, I, A. Ready? A. That's pretty good. <laughs> consensus. Okay, but I would bet if we were to do number five. Look at number five. Listen to this now. Listen to this. You know what you're doing. E, C, I, A. C, I. Good place. We have a lot of CIs in there. I want to hear somebody who's not a CI to give an argument for something other than CI. Oh, no. <laughs> Everybody wants to hear it. Let's hear it. It's a simple question. You think it's too simple? Yes. yes. Too simple? Anybody else agree with that? Yep. So it's too simple and therefore it's not concept. So a concept invention has to be difficult. But I don't think it's about inventing a concept, it's about stating a fact. It's just stating a fact? Okay. And I will give, okay, so there's no right answer here. This is kind of the, you know, in terms of the questions, this is, you know, this is you know, convert or divergent. This is divergent, but I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, a lot of people put CI there, but it's just like, mm, I hope so. Depends on the kid. Depends on the kid. Depends on their prior knowledge. Um, how about number seven? Uh, let's do seven. You ready for the big conduction? Let's, 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 you know, let's put the downbeat. Hey. I heard the CI over here. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. The CI people. Well, we didn't think it was application. Because? Because you were giving me one nation, and I guess. You said CI, huh? We did. All right, all right. No, I understand it. And, and generally, you have this order. You know, the first couple questions have got to be exploration. Then you have CI, then after the CI, hopefully are the application ones. Hopefully after the CI, you don't go back to exploration ones. That'd be a waste of time. And so, just because of the order, I can see A, but you said CI, correct? Yeah. Give me a reason why. I thought I was going to But it's still covering the content that was from the first All right. We've been given all the information and we've been oh. applied to something new. There was nothing, nothing new there. Okay, I could understand well, that's that. That's how we saw it. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to give you a task now. Oh, any questions? So a pogo activity, let's, let's review a second. A pogo activity is going to have a specific anatomy. And the anatomy of a pogo activity is you have a model, and a model uh, to begin with, I love having people use graphs, because that's a logical model. But a model can be a graph, it can be a figure, it can be a newspaper article, it can be a video, it can be a lot of different things. But to begin with, a graph is a great thing to start. Something I'm trying out with my students, because they're 18 year olds, graphic novels. These little comic strip things, you know, and I'm having an artist put together some things of uh, like immunology, you know, the history of immunology, the first vaccinations, things like that. But to begin with, to begin with, a graph is a terrific way to start. And then after the graph, you've got questions. You've got questions. And the questions must follow the learning cycle. Exploration, concept invention, application. Now, many pogo activities will have a second model. After the first, you know, and after the first model, you go through your questions, and then you turn the page, and there's a second model, and there's a second set of questions. To begin with, though, you don't need a second model. We can just use one model. We can go around the learning cycle once. That's fine. 
Um, what I want you to do is in teams, um, take someone's model, and for the next three minutes or so, two minutes, use one person's model and just write exploration questions. Have a recorder write them down and have the others just brainstorm only exploration questions. And I'm going to have you do this for about two minutes, but you got to choose one person's model. Bring it out. Is this a graph? I call it a figure. Would you call it a figure? All right, so just to give you, here's a real give me. Um, for the uh, exploration, if you have a graph, <coughs> my first question is always, what's the x-axis? What's the y-axis? What are the units? Mm -hmm. You know, and be simple. Again, you know, it's simple, simple, simple. And a part of this is just psychology. To give your weaker students some confidence. It's like, yes, I got one. I know that. You know, give them some confidence. All right, I want you to look at this. I think even our non-life science people know this one. Parts of art, right? So here, here's a statement that I'm going to make that uh, I think is, is fair. Not everything fits into a pole hole. Okay, mm -hmm. not everything fits into a pole hole. Teaching bones of the skull, not really a pole hole activity. It's just, you know, I call it drill and kill or fill the bucket. <laughs> just kind of do it, yeah, just yeah. do it. But, you know, the bone or the, the, the anatomy of the heart is not really a pole hole activity. But, they did come up with a, a topic that is, a, is very culturally. And what is it? Tell us what you're going to do. Blood circulation through the heart. Blood flow through the heart. Yes. That's a basic concept. What is the blood flow through the heart? Now this next component is concept invention. And I want you to put away the questions for about two minutes. And I want you just to have a good conversation about what is it that your students are to learn. What's the goal? What's the objective of this activity? And see, if, you know, just talk for two minutes, and then at 3.19, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna have you write a sentence. But until then, just talk. Intelligent people talking about what you want your students to learn. You've got it nailed. You've got it easy. <laughs> Go back and look at this word empathy again here. Uh, we're looking at a hepatitis vaccination thing here with all sorts of complicated inf information that my students would just go, I'm totally confused, I'm out of here. But for, these are physicians, you know, in training? First year? What year? Four. Okay. A fourth year, you know, medical training has huge amounts of prior knowledge. They've had clinical experience that, you know, 18 year olds don't have. So prior knowledge is an important component to write down when you're making a, a, an activity. And so like this activity, you know, my inside-outside activity, I had a teacher's version, you know, a teacher's guide, and a part of that is a paragraph on what I expect students to know and don't know. You know, and it's just like, they're just starting their career, they're just starting their education in physiology. This is a very early unit versus, you know, we got some uh, clearance and kidney physiology going over here, and it's just like, this is complicated, but they're in, you know, the, the, the latter parts of their, their first year physiology activity, and they should be calling upon quite a bit of stuff. You know, but you have to, you have to lay out, if you're an author, what your students, you know, know, and also what don't they know. What don't they know? Because for, you know, for physicians, or let's say, you know, nephrologists doing that activity, it's just, there's no thinking involved. They just know it. But for students trying to, you know, learn the stuff, they, uh, you know, they go through the inquiry thing. But the prior knowledge is an important part. Um, all right, so the next two minutes, I want you to try to write a couple questions that are concept invention. You have the concept in front of you. That's what you just wrote down. You have that nice cogent sentence. Come up with a couple questions that'll help students along the way. Two or three minutes, go. We're 90 minutes into knowing about Murray, Jensen, and Pogo. I'm going to see if you uh, have enough information. This is a good inquiry thing. Do you think I like the word defined? Does anybody want to say yes? Huh, you know me pretty well. So, when I do workshops like this and I work with people to try to write Pogo activities, I'll put this word up there and then... I'll put a big X. If you write, you know, my, um, my background says define is a lazy way to write a question. That's an easy way. And now you've gone to the world of worksheets. It's not a photo activity, you're a worksheet. And sometimes worksheets are fine.
Okay, pole doesn't fit everywhere. Sometimes, you know, there's just activities that, you know, let's just get through it, that fill the bucket activity. It's not difficult. But hopefully we're working on something that's kind of tough. It's a difficult concept. And if you're using the word define, you're not being polo. So do not use the word define. I'm going to give you another minute. We're working on concept invention, and we're not using the word define. We're just brainstorming questions. Keep going. Another minute. Go. I want you to look at uh, question number six. I think you can see the word cogent in there. It's a sign that I wrote the question. As a group, write a, co a complete and cogent explanation of how to determine if an item is inside or outside a body. So I was, I was bragging about my high school teachers, my secondary teachers, and one of them called me to task on this question. And tell me what they called me to task on. The word cogent? No. <laughs> complete? They said, Murray, you're basically taking the word define and making it fancy. Because <laughs> if you think about it critically, you're basically using the word define. And I'm going, I gotta have something to just target concept invention, just spot on, just nail it. And that's the best I can do. In your own words, explain the relationship between the x and the y axis. And in, in graphs, a lot of times, the title of the graph is your content object. You know, and so you can you can eliminate the title of the graph and have the activity. <laughs> <laughs> I can make this part <laughs> So an activity, a real simple one to go after Google is to have a graph, X and Y and all the data, and don't have the title and have them derive the title. And that's a concept invention. That's a good concept invention. That's a that's a trick. But there's other ways to get to concept invention questions besides that. But that's the little trick that I have in my hip pocket, which is, in your own words, explain the relationship between this and that, or explain the concept of active listening, or, you know, they, you know what was, what'd you come up with? Can I ask? The flow through the, through the uh, heart. What'd you come up with for your uh, concept invention question? Uh, well, they need some additional information before you get to it, but it was basically, um, Identify the direction of blood flow through the heart. Forward. <laughs> Am I wrong? You're not wrong, uh, which means I would need to clarify that question um, along the lines of you know, identify what structures the blood flow passes as it moves through the heart. All right, sounds like we're getting to application here. So now we're, you know, at the clock, we got about 25 minutes left here. I want you to spend a couple minutes writing application questions. Now that you've got the concept invention and stuff, I want you to spend a couple minutes brainstorming application questions. Four minutes. Go to work. Application questions. Four minutes. Now it's here, you know, if you're writing notes on something, it's here that you get that convergent and divergent question component. And, the, and to write a good convergent and divergent component, uh, question, oh, I just giggle and I finally get a good one. Mm -hmm. And I get students like the tattoo question. It's just like, yeah, I'm gonna get them on this one. It's gonna make them think. And that's fun. You know, coming up with questions that make them think, oh, that's, that's really good stuff. This is the tough one. You know, does anybody disagree? That coming up with concept invention ones, that's tough. This is where you earn your money. Um, now, you've got a set of questions. You've got some of these, some of these, some of these, you know, and you've got a model. Um, why don't you go through and, and try to create an activity and just circle, you know, cross out the questions you don't like and circle the ones you do like with the goal of trying to make an activity that's like half hour long. I don't know. How long are your classes? A pogo lesson should be able to get done in your class session. You know, one class session, one pogo activity, or less, that inside-outside activity was probably about 20 minutes long. You know, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, case studies, you know, medicine's got a lot of case studies. Those typically are, you know, days long. A pogo activity is closely related to a case study, but it should be able to get done in like 15 minutes to 45 minutes. But go through your questions right now and select the ones that you like best and just circle them. Cross out the ones you don't like. I've been involved in a two-year project 
And the two-year project, you think, oh, you should be able to create hundreds of activities. No. <laughs> this is hard. Writing a good activity is really hard. Because it involves you know, the process that you've been through. And then you have to go try it out with some students in different settings, with different teachers, different instructors, different levels. And then you get feedback. And then you take that feedback and you find out question number five was awful. We got to cross out question. We thought it was good, but it's just awful. We need a new question five. And oh, we're, the, what we thought was concept invention, uh -uh, wasn't working. And so this idea of formative evaluation, you know, the idea of getting uh, feedback and then revision, it's exhausting. And there's been days where it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm tired. You know, and I'm working with my sets of educators and my core group of people, and we're trying to come up with, uh, you know, revisions, you know, based on comp just like when you get revisions back in your papers. It's just like I've got to accommodate all these different things. Um, so you've got a first start. You know, you're two hours into Pogel now, basically. You know, and that's a good good first step. Um, when we when we do the official stuff. We always come up with two activities, or excuse me, two two documents for every activity. And you know, we've got an activity on parathyroid hormone osteoporosis, calcium hormone spaces. But the instructor's guide would contain things like estimated time, what's the prior knowledge, content and process objectives. You know, and this is kind of what we're talking about. What's the content? We could spend time on what's the process objectives. And a big one that I love hitting. Students will be able to take a data table and convert it into a graph and take the graph and make sense of the information. <laughs> and now here's, here's a general complaint I have. My students don't know how to read graphs. Just generally, reading graphs is difficult for my students, and I try to work on that. And, and a big phrase I use in a lot of settings is having students make sense of data. You know, being able to get a story out of the data. What does this mean? That's, that's an easy activity for Polo. Um, student roles, answer key, and then the student stuff um, models. Um, I'm starting you off easy. You know, look at your, look those graphs that I had. You know, that's, that, those are the easiest models I know. This model here was created by my artist, the one who had the, uh, uh, the uh, mitochondria in his arm. But that's a fun model for my students. It's just like, does that look like a human being? It's a round human. You know, it's just like, is that useful in any way? Well, it's very useful. But in creating uh, what's called robust models, models that require some thought, that's another part that can take some time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the convergent questions that, you know, there you go, learning cycle stuff. But that's all the different uh, things you get when you get a polo activity. And, um, to be a POGO activity, officially it means it's been endorsed by the POGO organization. And <coughs> that's, that's the review process. You, know, you submit your activities to the POGO organization and then they're reviewed. And they might have feedback and then you know, finally it's just like getting a paper accepted. So congratulations, your POGO activity has been accepted. And uh, right now, I think I've, I got a slide of the list of them. I think we have 15, and I'm, I'm going to shoot for a bunch more. But this, this next uh, slide is, goes back to that first rule of teaching. Remember the first rule of teaching? You teach the way you've been taught. You teach the way you've been taught. To teach with these materials, can you see yourself lecturing? Does this lend itself to lecture this? No, it makes no sense. You give this to students and, and, and let, them, let them do the work. Your role now has changed. You know, historically, lecturers are called or, uh, sage on the stage. Have you heard that cliche? I am the sage on the stage. I am an actor. I verbalize the stuff that you need to know. And now the cliche is what is the new one for an inquiry? Sage on the stage to? God on the side. There it is, the guide on the side. And I like the phrase, oh, this is fun, fire starter. I like the phrase fire starter. Are you sure that's right? That doesn't look very good. You have confidence? Does she know what she's doing? I want not a clue. <laughs> but fire starter is somebody who goes around and stirs things up, mixes things up, especially for groups that are a little quiet. Some kids are just natural to inquiry, and they they don't need your help. But quiet students are the ones. Who, and it's just like, are you sure? You know, they might have a lot going on. You just don't hear it. But a fire starter stirs things up. And uh, one of my high school teachers 
was asked the following question. And I love this, because this just hits the core of what we're trying to do. And the question from a kid was, Mr. Sharp, are you ever going to give us a straight answer? <laughs> to which Mr. Sharp said, what do you think? <laughs> and I'm going to write that up, because that's just so perfect. But that my high school teachers do this so much better. Um, and another thing, and I think another reason they do it better, is they have more time than the college professors. College professors is like, this, that, 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 this week. And, but my high school teachers, they will say, yesterday, you sucked. You didn't do a very good job. We're going to spend another day on this activity, and we're going to make sure you get it right. You know, the college professors are, here we go, next topic. But my high school teachers, they have the luxury of time, and they can say, no, we're not, we didn't learn it. We got to stop. We're going to we're going to spend another day on it. And so for them, you know, an activity like this, two days, two days. You know, and they can really make sure the kids get it. And what's fun, and, and, and that I don't I don't see it with my college students, but the high school kids, it's just like this is so cool. Did you know a fetus in in, in the uterus is not really in the body, <laughs> and they get excited. And that's so fun to be around. You know, and that energy, I cannot create in a lecture hall. That's an energy that I can get close to, you know, with my 18, 19 year old college students in an active learning room. Because you see kids all, you see kids thinking, and it's so fun. It's just like, and, and you start to see, I'll give you a classic case. Most of you know about insulin and blood sugar. And historically, I would, you know, write things out on the board, and I'd ask a question like, Hyperinsulinism will lead to what in terms of blood glucose? And historically, my students would go, they'd look it up. <laughs> they'd look it up. <laughs> but now, I'd say, hyperinsulinism leads to what in terms of blood glucose? Oh, hypo, you know, hy hy hypoglycemia. And it's just like they can figure it out for themselves without going back to their notes. They know it. And I had a kid say this, who was like a third year student. Kind of know it in your bones. I love that. Kind of know it in your bones. You don't have to think about it. You just know it in your bones. And I'm just like, oh, thank you. That's nice. But the relationship between, and that's one of our activities, the relationship between, you know, glucose and insulin is fundamental. Got to know that. And they know it in their bones after this activity. But Dee Silverthorne wrote an article. It's difficult to change the way we teach lessons from another NSF project. But her project, you know, her big take home lesson was this to try to get traditional instructors to go to inquiry is tough. It's really tough. And she has evidence of it there. And so, something I tell people that are, are jumping onto this ship is be kind to yourself. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have days you just go, oh, let me lecture. And keep moving. Keep moving. You know, try something else. And you're, it's going to be a learning process. But don't try to, you know, change the world in one day. You know, look for a couple activities that you think, this is a good one. This will fit. Let's try this out. And another thing I try to get people to do is do it earlier in your class. Because like by the 10th week, you know, the word I use is ossified. <laughs> Someone's ossified in their behaviors. But in the first couple days, they're more malleable. You can get them to do something. Like, oh, oh, university yeah. Here's my crew. There's a college. This is something I think, you know, I'll brag a second. I think we do this better in the States than you guys are doing right now. But we're mixing things up, secondary and post-secondary, you know, tertiary. But that is my world. I'm trying to get all these different people who are teaching students uh, physiology to work together. You know, if I do this, then you can do that. If you do this, then I can do this. But you get everybody at the table, and we try to write activities. And what's what's interesting here is my high school my high school instructors they really know how to write these content objectives because they live in that world because they've got to be accountable to principals and the government. And my college professors they know the physiology better. And these create pretty good teams. These make really good teams. But this is my initial polo workshop where we started to develop activities. And this is my research team. And this is who we studied. 
and that kind of were responsible for the, the final activities. Um, but they're the ones who came up with the 15, and there's the 15. And these are the ones that have now officially been endorsed. You know, so if you've got something up there, these are going to be published through Bogle and, uh, and going to be distributed by my professional organization, HAPS. Um, you know, I think I'm going to quit there. i got another couple slides, but I don't think I need to go any farther because we've got only four minutes left. I want you to ask me some questions. <laughs> ask a question. Most of those that 15 that you've got listed up there are more physiology than anatomy. Yes. So here's what I've said, and I learned this after the first year. Physiology is a natural fit. Physiology is a natural fit for, for Bogle. Anatomy can fit, but it's going to be more difficult. And so at a Bendigo, no, yeah, up in the Latrobe, gave a workshop up there, and we had an anatomist doing comparison of male and female pelvis. That had fit, you know, compare and contrast the male and female pelvis. That one worked. But if you're just looking at straight anatomy, it um, doesn't fit. But then if you start doing comparative anatomy and start doing some, some interpretation of some things, but generally you gotta have, you know, not just a bone, but two bones or three bones, or maybe go with development. But I don't have a real good answer for you. You know, but I will say anatomy uh, doesn't fit as well as physiology. Okay, so if you strict, if you teach strict anatomy, and one of my one of my people, you know, is a strict anatomist. He had a harder time. He had a harder time coming up with uh, physiology activities than my physiologist. And he went after what do you go after? Oh, uh, calcium homeostasis. You know, he made that fit in his room. You know, do, do home, is homeostasis an, an anatomy activity? That's, you know, he kind of made it physiology. And what he used the word is uh, functional anatomy. Yeah, functional anatomy. There's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of functional anatomy concepts that are important. I think the challenge for anatomy is to identify what are important anatomical concepts that actually needs to be imparted to your audience. And that's probably more difficult than in physiology, right? Yeah. Can you name one? Give us an example. Of a functional. Functional anatomical concept. So, for example, when teaching about facial bones and skulls, I might think about the important concept behind what is the functional purpose of facial bones in protecting the, the content of the skull. So uh, I'm just this is just off the top of my head, just thinking about is or what is the evolutionary basis oh, like for um, two leggedness <laughs> <laughs> or like, yeah or pneumatic bones. Why do pneumatic bones what is the evolutionary base significance of new pneumatic bones in the fish, in skull and facial bones. And you're looking at quite a bit of prior knowledge there, yeah. too. That's yeah. not your first week of anatomy. No, no, no. no. <laughs> We've got, we, um, interact with the Polytechnic in Singapore, mm -hmm. which do problem-based learning. And one of their anatomy things for the face is about smiling and the different muscles and nerves mm -hmm. and things that are involved in, in, in the smile. Yeah. But I reckon for, facial expressions. Mm -hmm. I reckon for, this is, this is just my idea, uh, but I reckon for basic anatomy, when you're starting off, you probably need to get them to think about the descriptive nature of anatomy itself. So getting them to explore, explore anatomy as a language. So that's what my PhD is about, is looking at interaction and, and at anatomy as a language itself. So looking at teaching anatomy and basic anatomy from a linguistic perspective rather than uh, rather than uh, getting students to be comfortable with, oh, you know, this is describing things. This is about what are the vocabularies involved in exploring, you know, get, get them a whole list of muscles. Well, there must be regularity. Anatomy has regularity, so yeah. getting them, that's a concept right there for basic anatomy. What is the regular descriptive language of anatomy? So we have a couple activities on medical terminology, yeah. you know, which then could lead to body regions, which could then lead to nomenclature. Yeah. You know, so you've got a logical progression there, but again, I got to get back to the notion of not everything fits in the mold. Yeah. You can pick and choose, yeah. you know. And then the other thing that's important is this is not a replacement for the textbook. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is you know kind of a second thing going. And the other um, uh, another another one here is your worksheets that your your activities that you've been trying to develop. They're good. You know, you should try these out with. Uh, 
uh, your students now and say, hey, this is this is a different type of activity, and we're going to try it out. It's not officially POGO, but it doesn't have to officially be POGO to be good. You don't need that stamp, you know, in order for it to be used. You can use it now, uh, but uh, you, you're progressing. You know, to, to have that word POGO on it, it's kind of like the end of the game. You're done revising it, and even then, I, I don't know. I think I'll probably go back and revise some of these again. You know, in five years, because the words and the questions will change and get some more. <laughs> um, what's the evidence that POGO uh, increases learning? Yeah, so uh, science of teaching and learning. So you get journals like. Uh, the, uh, the Journal of Advances in Physiology, and you've got some others, and, you, and I'll put on my skeptic's hat too. To do education evaluation is really difficult, and it's expensive. You know, if somebody's doing cheap and easy stuff, and cheap and easy to me is re-engineering re our teaching staff is very time-consuming and expensive mm -hmm. too. Oh yeah, very much so. so and so there's a critic that just says, Bogle doesn't work. Vogel doesn't work, and then and then that further critic says nothing really works. You know, if you want to get down to it, if Vogel doesn't work, does group learning work? Does what you know? And and uh, so I have a I have a mentor that's a science education person, and he says if you really want to be critical, if you really want to be a critic, in the hundred years of science education research, there's only two things where there's evidence enough to say that works. Well, is not one of them. Do you know what they are? There's only two things that work. Sitting an exam. <laughs> now these are you're in kind of different domains. Cooperative group learning, when done correctly, and then what's called concept mapping. But those are the two things. Everything else is just kind of like we're trying to show that it works. But to, to you know, answer your question, I do not have definitive evidence. I have little hints. And, and now I'm going to be really unscientific and says, my gut tells me what's happening in the room now is more enjoyable and more beneficial than what's happening in the lecture theater. Now is that, can I put that in a research paper? Murray Jensen's gut tells him that what he's doing now is good. And I have all my teachers up here who are going, it took me a while. It took, took a while to drink Murray's Kool-Aid. Isn't that a weird thing to phrase? I go back to it. But to do this is difficult. But my, my, my room now is so different than what it was, and I enjoy it. My kids don't necessarily always like it because they don't have the answers in front of them. They don't have that security blanket of, of all having all this closure all the time. They're on edge because it's just like, I don't know the answer. And we like that because that's the real world of physiology. But the evidence, I agree with you, it's not there. And I've got a couple colleagues that are trying to develop assessment instruments. And one that's on the way is on homeostasis. I can't wait for that thing to get developed. But it takes, you know, I, I had a, another, the same mentor, you know, that she said, if, if the evaluation isn't expensive, it probably isn't any good. And there hasn't been any really expensive evaluation of Polo. And it's all been just let's create some materials and then some some little little stuff on the side. But I agree with you. The evidence isn't there yet. Is there evidence that lecture works? Which I'd say yes. We have lots of physicians, we've got lots of nurses, we've got lots of people who are very functional in their jobs who were educated primarily by lecture. So that we do have some evidence there. So we'll see. Well maybe they'll raise your head the slide the next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going somehow. I think we're done. You can hang out and ask, ask questions. I know many of you got to get going, but I hope to see you uh, a little over here. Yeah. Like, so you learn tricks like if you can hear my voice, clap. Yeah.